Once again, hi everyone. I'm Edmund DeVoe. I'm the president of the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association, the state's first and largest trade association developed to help the state create a responsible, sustainable, diverse and profitable cannabis industry. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Our sponsors are Argus 365, a security firm, Burton Trend Public Affairs, Cure Relief, also a license holder and board member, Ease, Financial Resources Federal Credit Union, Garden State Greenhouse, Puffin Entrepreneurs and Investors, Sheet Metal Workers, Local 19, Sprague Energy, a new sponsor, Welcome Sprague, Welcome Rich, Siska Hennessy Group, a construction outfit, the UFCW, Locals 360 and 152, and Weeds Direct. I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, today, I am not at a restaurant, uh, but uh, am in a celebratory mood nonetheless. At some point, uh, I want you all to sing happy birthday to my daughter, Brianna, whose birthday is tomorrow, uh, but uh, just wanted to share that as well. Uh, so as we get started uh, today, a couple of uh, important announcements. Uh, April 5th, next Tuesday, I uh, want to remind everyone that the NJCBA and Stockton University uh, are co-hosting, along with Cannabis Insider, a job fair and expo, career fair and expo. That's next Tuesday down in Stockton. Please visit our uh, website in the events tab, and you will find a link to that event. So that's next Tuesday. April 11th, the CRC has scheduled a meeting for April 11th. April 27th, talking about our sponsors, April 27th, NJCBA networking event hosted by the UFCW and Hugh Giordano will be down in West Berlin, New Jersey. So for all those that were wondering when we were going to go south of 195, April 27th, uh, we'll be with the UFCW. So thank you, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, all of our Lunch and Learn segments, we try to bring you uh, the best and the brightest uh, in multi-industries uh, so that you understand how to be uh, a significant part of this emerging cannabis industry. Uh, today is absolutely uh, a special honor for me uh, to be able to share uh, the virtual stage uh, with my friend of over 20 years, uh, Michael Turner. Uh, Michael is the founder and uh, managing partner of Birch and Trent Public Affairs. Uh, Michael has created uh, in Birch and Trent a top 20 lobbying firm in the state of New Jersey. Uh, and there's no doubt if you've ever been on Lobbyist Row uh, or been around anyone in Lobbyist Row there on West State Street, if there is a matter that is too difficult and you don't want to do it, there's only one person in Trenton that you call, and that's Michael Turner. Uh, Michael has developed an outstanding reputation as, as a winner, a go-getter, and uh, I, I, his reputation speaks for itself. And we are proud that he is, in fact, uh, the NJCBA policy advisor. And uh, without, can't be said enough, uh, NJCBA, the Cannabis Business Association, exists in large part uh, to Michael's efforts. So, Michael, I just want to welcome you to Lunch and Learn. Thank you. It's, it's great to be a panelist here. I've attended many of your Lunch and Learns, Ed, and, and learned a lot from a lot of very interesting people. And thank you. It's an honor for me to be here with you as well, <clears throat> my friend of over 20 years, um, and, uh, and to be part of you know, this exciting uh, movement here, this emerging economy, uh, with all the individuals that are on not only this webinar here, but that I've met over the course of the last several years. So it truly is. I met some amazing people, over, and it's been a great experience and truly a highlight of my life. Um, yeah. You know, Michael, let, let's pause it just for a minute, because I think as we get into what your topic is, um, people may have been around you and not not even realized it. Uh, when we were in the early days of advocacy, uh, you and I uh, would enter the state house and uh, your, your efforts there to try and get legalization across the threshold. You were there on the ground. So thank you for that. Absolutely. And, you know, I do have a little bit of a shrinking personality and at over six feet tall. And as the girth that I have, I'm, I go unnoticed wherever I go. 
But at the same time, um, all, all jokes aside, you mentioned going to the state house and you mentioned getting legalization done. Let me give for the benefit of everyone on the audience. If you if you if you grew up um, watching Schoolhouse Rock, um, you know how a bill becomes a law. And if you didn't see Schoolhouse Rock on ABC on Saturday mornings, well, then you missed a major part of your childhood. But at the same point, um, legislation, government affairs is difficult. And, and, and that's for a good reason. Least of which is that I have a career, or Ed and I have careers and such in, in this space. But also, if you can imagine if it was easy to pass legislation, just the ridiculousness that we would see that comes out of uh, a lot. And the, we'll get into some of the ridiculousness in a minute uh, when I go through the, the list of the legislation that, um, that we're currently monitoring uh, on behalf of the membership of the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association. But let's go a little bit of a history lesson back at, uh, you know, a few years back. Up until about 2020, our main focus, not only as an organization, but as your policy advocate for the uh, uh, for the organization, was uh, on legalization. And we went and we attended all those hearings and we testified and we had a seat at the table uh, while the lawmakers were trying to craft the enabling legislation that would stand up this economy here in New Jersey. And ultimately, as everyone realizes, you know, it became a bridge too far. So the legislature and the administration decided that they were gonna put it on the ballot. Right. And so then our, our attention shifted from passing legislation to passing a ballot question, which, as everyone's painfully aware, passed two years ago and um, at like 70 percent plurality, which was amazing, uh, just shows the strong support for legalized, legitimate cannabis industry and, and economy here in New Jersey. But it's still taking too long in many people's minds. But like I said before, if it were rushed, there's a lot of pitfalls, a lot of mistakes that we've learned from other states. I was on the phone with somebody the other day from the legislature in Colorado that said to me, hey, New Jersey's doing it right. Now, before everybody on the chat says, what are you talking about doing it right? They had so many mistakes that we learned from as a state. Okay, and Ed's gonna talk a little bit about that maybe as far as like what New York's coming up with recently. But we, may, we avoided so many of the pitfalls that states like Colorado, Oregon, Oklahoma had done you know, awarding license to just anybody. A lot of people lost a lot of money and took a lot of time, okay? New Jersey's seeking to avoid that, and that's a good thing, okay? But at the same time, it's taking a lot longer than a lot of people would expect. But, you know, I think then that's for a good reason. I don't like it, it doesn't make me happy, but I understand that that might be the, the best way forward. So after the, the, the referendum passed, we moved quickly as an organization to help stand up the enabling legislation that, that set up the economy, which set up the, you know, how the, in, the regulations are gonna govern the industry and how, and how the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the licensing uh, application process was going to work. Um, we'll tell you that, you know, we might not own the table, Burton Trent that is, and we certainly don't, might not um, uh, have built the table, but we certainly have a seat at the table when these when the regulations are being passed and we, in fact, in many cases, you know, chose the menu. All right. So, you know, we are on the forefront of the policy experts that the legislature calls on when it comes to advocating for what is in the best interest of the industry. OK, and we'll get into some of those pieces of legislation in a minute. There's 28 uh, distinct pieces of legislation. Well, more like 20 because there's some have Senate and Assembly uh, companion bills, they call them. Um, Another side, little bit of a, of a bit of a um, housekeeping issue for those who don't understand the legislative process in New Jersey. In Washington, D.C., they have two houses of the, of, the, of the Congress, right? You have the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. They can pass individual pieces of legislation. And then when they pass, they have what they call a conference committee. And that conference committee is, is tasked with making sure that the two bills are uniform. OK, and they look exactly alike. And then they go back and they cut deals and whatever it is. And that's how all the sausage is made. In New Jersey, both bills in both houses, the General Assembly and the, and the State Senate, have to be identical. There is no conference committee. So that's what leads to some of the delays every once in a while. Someone will throw in something that, that they, they that in order to get their vote, they want to see this specific you know, element of the, uh, of the regulations addressed. And the other house hasn't even considered it yet. It delays things. But at the end of the day, you know, the deals are cut, usually in the, in the wee hours and and you know and and agreements are made and then the bill moves out of both houses uniformly to the governor's desk 
okay? Which then takes on a life of its own at that point too. So we did all that with legalization and standing up the regulatory structure, which got us to the licensing uh, portal set up and opening uh, at the end of last year, December 15th of 2021. So as an organization and in our policy role uh, for the organization, we have, you know, pushing hard to make sure that those deadlines were met, the portals were open, licenses, you know, applications were being taken, uh, hopefully no IT issues again, you know, and all those other issues that surround um, that. While at the same time, um, you know, talking to members of the CRC staff about, you know, questions that they had and getting input from the industry about what they think is appropriate to move forward. So, so, so now that we've passed the threshold of the, the, the dispensary license, um, at, you know, application portal being open is now when we're starting to focus our attention more on all the, what they call the corrective pieces of legislation that are currently pending in this new legislative session. And if I could share my screen, April, I'd appreciate it. So yeah, Michael, as you're bringing the screen up, just so that everyone gets a, a feel or more of a feel, thank you for that background. Imagine this, imagine the, the I've been using the term evolutionary because we have been moving forward, but five years ago, we had one bill to worry about. And that was the legalization bill. Michael is sharing with us today that from a policy standpoint and the things that the NJCBA has to be aware of, over 20 bills now. And, uh, and so this is a task and, and your membership, your sponsorship helps, helps us do this. So this is, uh, this is an amazing time going from one bill to, to over 20. I can't share my screen yet, Ed, so I don't know. Oh, wait, here it goes. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm there. All right. Can everyone hear me? We can okay. hear you, but we don't okay, see the screen share. It's coming. Oh. Can you see it now? There we go. Okay. So everybody, so here are, this is a spreadsheet of the, all the legislation that's currently uh, pending before this, this session of the legislature. I'm going to scroll through it really quickly here. I'm going to go back to the top again. Okay, so once again, you know, some of them have, you know, the Senate and Assembly companion versions, and here are the sponsors, and here are the date that it was that it was it was um, it was introduced. Let's go to the top here though and take a look at some of this. So here's a bill. It was originally pre-filed, okay, um, by by strong advocates of legalization here, um, and they've been champions of this of this effort since since the beginning especially uh, Assemblyman Dan uh, Danielson and Assemblywoman Quijano. Um, this is a, is a bill that is, is, is critically important, but it's important um, as, as businesses in the industry, but it's also important to the, the insurance companies that are part of our association and those folks that are, that are providing insurance because they're gonna wanna see the details here, okay? This bill prohibits insurers from dropping um, companies or employees if they're a uh, medical cannabis um, or a, 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 uh, a recreational cannabis user simply because they are a medical or, or recreational cannabis user. Not because they were doing anything like operating under the influence, like if they're operating heavy machinery or they were uh, unable to perform their, their task as an employee, this, this legislation is intended to, to prevent insurance companies from dropping companies if they have folks who happen to be you know, cannabis enthusiasts or patients. At the same time, the bill also says it doesn't require insurance companies to cover um, companies with insurance, or provide them with insurance um, uh, if, if they feel that they, don't, they, they shouldn't have to. So you can't be dropped, but you also don't have to provide the insurance, you know, for a, for a new a new customer is what I'm saying. Once again, the devil is in the details. I would encourage, you know, this spreadsheet is going to be on the Canada Business uh, website. And what I did here with the with the spreadsheet is so all the members can see not only like who the members are that that sponsor the legislation, what the bill number is. Okay, I also provided their email addresses. And then there's a link up here to the bill language itself. I would encourage all members to read that, okay? If you're so inclined. Okay, but these are the types of bills that are gonna go in to straighten out some of the 
perhaps oversights or omissions that were included in the in the first bill okay the, the legalization bill the, the enabling leg legislation that ultimately led to the way that the crc regulates this industry okay so this like i said look this spreadsheet here is going to be up on our site okay let me stop sharing this one okay now i'm going to go into some of the ones that i want to focus on um let's see where am i here so thank you michael while you're doing that uh for those of you who had joined us during our earlier lunch and learns this year uh, we were fortunate to have uh the senate president nick scatari uh with us we had uh, speaker coughlin speaker craig coughlin uh on our lunch and learn and they made it very clear during those lunch and learns that the legislature is not afraid to legislate uh there will be no shortage uh, of bills as michael is sharing uh, and and Michael, you alluded to it. It's a public process. It's sure everyone, is. everyone in our association, everyone in the public, is not only able but is encouraged to be part of this process. Your voices matter. It, absolutely. And to that point, Ed, voices do matter. And you're going to see some legislation in here that may or not be intended to actually pass at some point, but it's to send a message. Okay, for example, let me get into a little bit of the presentation here. So we talked about this first bill that talked about the insurance coverages, okay? Now here's one, Assemblyman uh, Roy Fryman, great guy, okay? Um, this I think is critically important to this industry as well. It, it, it allows micro businesses to accelerate the depreciation of their real property and equipment and such, which is a perfectly legitimate uh, business write-off for any other industry except cannabis, okay? Because it's still a schedule one drug on the federal level. So this bill um, is intended to try to address that concern, okay, for, for cannabis uh, companies in New Jersey. Now, here's what you need to know a little bit of the subtle nuances here. Assemblyman Fryman is the only sponsor and there's only a Senate, bill, uh, only an assembly bill. In order for a bill to pass, remember I mentioned before, there has to pass both houses and it has to be um, identical, right? So he doesn't even have a Senate co-sponsor or a Senate companion bill yet, nor is there anybody else that is in the General Assembly that has agreed to sign on to this bill. So this is a long-term play, probably because of the unique implications of a bill like that and how it structures, you know, it affects our tax code structure. Okay, so there's another bill that is uh, critically important. You know, let me get into one of the other ones here. So the, so here's one of the ones I was talking about before that is kind of introduced to send a message. Okay, now this bill, with the exception of one Democrat in the, in the assembly, has um, a lot of GOP support. And the bill is, is designed to make sure that as part of our, you know, state health and physical education curriculum, that students are taught about the dangers, uh, you know, and ramifications of cannabis use. Well, it might come as a surprise to some of you, but it shouldn't, that it's already part of our uh, curriculum in the public school system, okay? They talk about the same way they talk about alcohol abuse or overeating or not eating enough or eating the right foods in general, you know, nutrition, health and welfare. So not exactly sure why this bill was introduced, but I have my ideas. And it might, like I said, might come as a surprise to you that this, this bill is really not gonna go anywhere. Once again, it has an assembly, no Senate companion, and it's sponsored by the minority party. And, it, and again, probably just to send a message to the supporters or the constituents of those members of the legislature that they're keeping an eye on making sure that, you know, they're not indoctrinating students about cannabis use in public schools or in, our, in all our schools. So that bill, again, is kind of redundant to what is already existing as far as the risks of any excessive use of anything, including food and, and, and alcohol. Okay, so there's another there's another bill that's there. You're, you're welcome to uh, look at the PDF that's on there too. And like I said, it's gonna be on our website, on the, on the Cannabis Association website for you to read it if you want uh, you know some good reading. Now the next bill, okay, um, and I pulled only a few of them out of my spreadsheet because I wanted just to show you some uh, representative samples here. Um, uh, you know, providing protections for the employer and the employee when they there's in, you know, an issue of them, you know, being a, a, a 
legal cannabis uh, enthusiast or patient, okay? Very important that some of these like civil rights protections are in place. So you can guard against, you know, you know un, un, unfair dismissal, you know, fire from your job or, or what have you, okay? Um, again, items that might have been overlooked or omitted from the original enabling legislation. So you're gonna see a lot of that uh, happening, you know, over the next, uh, you know, a uh, few months in the, in the course of this of this legislature. Um, oh, here's a good one. Okay, Assemblywoman Mascara. Um, so you have cigar lounges and places like in the casinos where it's permissible to smoke cigarettes. That does not apply to cannabis, no matter what. That's what that's what uh, you know she's trying to propose here. Now, interestingly enough, a Democrat from South Jersey. Um, you know, the majority of uh, the towns in her district all voted in favor of cannabis, but she felt, you know, that it was important for her to put in legislation that clarified that you're not allowed to smoke cannabis in a place where, you know, otherwise like a cigar lounge or a casino where otherwise tobacco use is permitted. Again, doesn't have a Senate co uh, co-sponsor or, or companion legislation. Not exactly sure where it's going to go. It was pre-filed from a bill that was, you know, introduced last session that didn't go anywhere either. So, I mean, again, there's, there's, there's issues like that that are gonna pop up. There's a really good one in here that I wanted to show you. Okay, a, a, the middle one, everyone's probably paying very close attention on that one. Home grow, being able to have up to six plants um, for medical cannabis for your own personal use. Now, this particular bill sponsored by Assemblyman Auth, Republican out of Bergen County, uh, I, I don't believe is gonna go anywhere, okay? just considering that he's in the minority there really is no momentum behind the bill but we get on to the next oh hold on go back up um there is currently another bill which evidently picked up some sponsors yesterday thursdays are mondays and thursdays by the way everybody are session days when the legislature meets to vote on bills um picked up a couple's co-sponsors yesterday and that's allowing um home grow uh for medical patients um, and that's gaining some momentum too. That's one of the other bills that's on the spreadsheet. But um, issues like that, of, of course, that's contained, you know, up to a certain threshold and only for medical. And it's intended to offset the cost uh, for medicine for, for cannabis patients. So again, you know, some of the oversights, some of the omissions um, that have, uh, you know, have, uh, oh, let me go back to that. Hold on, I'm sorry that have, uh, were left out of the previous bill um, are now being, uh, with their, with their taking corrective action to, to make sure that the, those, those issues are addressed. For everybody that's on the, the webinar now, this is the link to the New Jersey legislative website. On there, you can search all the cannabis bills you want. Um, there's listings of your legislators, leadership, uh, committee structures, uh, what have you. So, you know, have at it. Um, you know, do all the research you want, please feel free to reach out to us as your advocates, the Cannabis Business Association, and express your concerns. You know, you have a problem with a certain bill. We will bring those concerns to the decision makers that are right now responsible for charting the future of this industry in the state. So let me go back to one more bill here. Ed, I apologize for jumping around and hope everyone's not getting like googly eyed looking at all these uh, on my screen here. I Where think there's a plant. I think there's a plant that will solve that. <laughs> I've heard of that one. Here we go. This this one right here, everybody. This is a good one. So we have a strong yes. We're not just for discussion or monitoring. This bill is already moving fast. Okay, this is Senator Vitale's bill in the Senate and Assemblyman Conaway, an MD, okay, out of, out of Burlington County uh, in the assembly, okay. This was a bill that is going to um, allow the cost of medical cannabis to be reimbursed by any one of the, the, the public support programs that people can qualify for, either they're permanently disabled, seniors, um, children relief fund, you're on, you know, you qualify for any one of those criteria for any one of those programs. Um, access to medical cannabis is going to, uh, allow you to, to, to get a discount or a reimbursement for some of the cost. Okay, this, big, this bill is, is already out of Senate Health, Human Services and Senior Citizens. It hasn't moved in the assembly yet, but it's on its way to the Senate Budget Committee because it taps into those resources 
of any one of those um, programs for, for, for anybody that's uh, disadvantaged. Um, it requires a budget, what they call a fiscal note. Okay, and that means, you know, redirecting of state resources to, to programs such as that. Okay, so that bill is moving pretty, pretty quickly. But so far, that's the only one that's moving anywhere. Um, all the rest of them have been what they call either introduced or even more importantly, pre-filed. Pre-filed means it was already in legislation last year, but it failed to move. So it was reintroduced this year in the hopes that they would move forward on it this session. Okay, so there's a lot of work here and there's a lot to pay attention to. Um, like I said, this spreadsheet is going to be up on the Canada Business uh, website. I encourage you all to uh, familiarize yourself with it, ask questions. There's links to all the, the pieces of legislation. There's links to the sponsors and their email addresses. Should you want to take it upon yourself to, to email them and express your support or questions or opposition, what have you. Okay. So um, with that, uh, Ed, I'm happy to take any questions you might have for me or from that of the um, from the audience for the for the good of the order. Michael, thank you so much. I, I think it's really important to every now and then stop and and go back to some of the basics. Uh, what we forget as as uh, leaders sometimes is that we know what we're talking about, but others don't. And so as we start talking about things, we understand it, but other people may not. So thank you for sharing that perspective. Uh, here, here's where I want you to weigh in. Um, public policy, and I've said this and, and many people have heard me say it, uh, there's no such thing as perfect public policy. Uh, the fact is that policy is introduced in the sense of legislation and people present their arguments for, their arguments against, but more importantly, and please share your thoughts on this because uh, I've done some uh, some interviews recently, had uh, some discussions recently, and there's this sense that there's right and wrong. And, and I think I want us to be careful of the, the notion of right and wrong, and that people are, are as, as policymakers, decision makers, that they're really working towards trying to get consensus. And so there's really not this, this well, you're right and you're wrong. It's, it's about how do we build consensus? So if you want to just share your well, thoughts on that. Absolutely. Look, there's an old adage in this business that if, if, not, if everybody is just not completely happy, then it's probably a good piece of legislation, okay? Because, you know, look, I've worked on issues where, you know, my clients and members of, of the clients association have said, wait a minute, the bill specifically doesn't say Michael Turner is going to be protected forever and ever and ever. You failed. And I'm like, well, unfortunately, the entire association is pretty damn happy with the legislation the way it came out. And I apologize that you didn't get exactly what you were looking for. But what you can do, though, is you can operate. You can operate successfully and you can continue to move forward. And if there are tweaks and what have you, that has to happen. But initially, this, you know, is the, is you got to take the best you can get and move on and move forward and continue to you know work tirelessly towards creating you know a, a better a set of laws. I mean, the United States is a more perfect union. It is not a perfect union. Okay, it never will be. Okay, and we need to work, continue to work hard. It, it, by the way, and if you're not working hard towards fixing it, you know, or, or addressing issues that might pop up, what else are you doing? Honestly, this is we're advocates. Okay, this is our mission. Okay, and if you're mission focused, the mission never really ends. You got to keep going. So to your point, someone's going to come up with a big, you know, better idea in a different state or at the federal level. That's fantastic. Let's 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 research it. Let's let's copy it. Let's use it on our, you know, to improve our own or have others look to us and have us share our good experiences with other states. OK, um, you know, Ed, like, you know, you had mentioned before about New York. Folks are being, you know, New York is 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 starting to get good on a road and they're already putting the, you know, the, the cart before the horse and um, they're, they're critical of, of New Jersey and how slow we're moving. But we're already doing some of the things that New York's calling on doing, you know, after the fact. I, I, I just, you know, I don't I, I I have to say that, you know, this is it's 
it's challenging and it's exciting. Um, it's scary. And um, because, you know, it, it's, it's constantly evolving. But if you're an entrepreneur and everybody that's in this business, you better have entrepreneurial spirit because this is a virgin territory. This is the wide open frontier right now in New Jersey. Um, we need to, you know, everyone bring your best efforts, your best brain power and pay attention and work towards the same common goal. Thank you, Michael. That, that's, again, I can't appreciate your, your insights enough. So Jamie posted a question uh, in the chat uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll lead uh, some of this and then I'll turn it over to you. Uh, the question, and uh, this has come to the association uh, this week uh, in, in many forms, uh, the Senate president has called for hearings uh, with, with respect to uh, why the process appears to be taking so long. And so I shared this, uh, and I shared it, I think, just yesterday. The Senate president, much the, the legislature has certain obligations, much like the CRC has obligations. And so the Senate president First of all, knowing the Senate president as we do, nobody, there is no sitting legislator that has poured more of him or herself into the legalization effort more than Senator Nick Scatari. Bar none, he is the sitting legislator with the most skin in the game. I can, I absolutely get his frustration with, with what was supposed to have happened what the intention was uh, with all of the hard work. So I absolutely get it. You call for public hearings. Now, that being said, public hearings, Jamie, if, if I may, are not punitive, right? In, in some cases, in some cases, right, they're meant to actually find, let's let's say, fault. I think in this instance, so there, there's been there's been progress. Uh, but maybe not to the extent that those who are true advocates have, have thought it should maybe have gone farther. So in this case, I don't view the senator's hearings as punitive, but I do find them in the realm of it for public good, public policy. Let's, let's find some answers. And if some fixes come out of it, that would be great. Uh, anyway, that, that's my sense. But knowing, again, Here's the guy spent, and if you go back to our earlier Lunch and Learn with Senator Scatari, he tells a story. 18 years ago, he gets elected to the legislature, and the first thing he does is go to then Senate President Dick Cody and says, hey, I want to introduce a bill for cannabis legalization. And then Senator Cody says, oh, you don't plan on being here long, do you? <laughs> so, so those are the types of things that, that we deal with. But um, anyway, I get the frustration. So Michael, your sense on the hearings. Yeah, I mean, Ed, I have to concur with you. If anybody has the, um, the, the, the uh, carte blanche to be critical of the CRC or the process of how it's moved along, it's Nick Scatari. I mean, the man has put so much effort into in getting this done that you know he's almost without question um, you know, when it comes to being, uh, you know, a, a, an advocate for the for the economy, for the industry in the state of New Jersey, and therefore has um, has right of first refusal to be critical of it too. I mean, the only thing I could say that's different um, from what Ed said is like, you know, why should the CRC or any of the other bureaucracies in the state of New Jersey be any different than all the rest of them? You know, I mean, it, it, it's it's an imperfect system. It's slow. This you have to understand though, and I need to say this for everybody that's that's listening. This is the first time any of these people are doing anything like this. Okay, this is the, the, the all new regulations, untested, unchallenged in court, no legal precedents, no case law that we can refer to, brand new virgin territory. It, it's gonna have growing pains, it really is, okay? It's an imperfect system. Um, I do believe that there are some things the CRC probably could have been tighter on. I mean, for example, the criticism that there were no black license winners. All the legislature said was, can you give us an accounting of how many black applicants actually applied and then how many were awarded license? And the CRC couldn't do it. Okay, why weren't they keeping track of those things? I don't know, but now they should. Okay, and they're gonna, and they have. 
Okay, so those are things like that that, you know, again, it's growing pains. They, they, weren't, they weren't tracking all the different demographics and what have you. There are bigger issues though, you know, with, with um, you know, what the CRC's announcement was last week, I think I might've missed an opportunity, okay, with the existing uh, ATCs um, to, to expand. But, you know, there's been, there's been issues. There's been issues with, you know, and, and look, some of the, some of these ATCs are our board members. They'll, they'll freely admit it. You know, they've been, you know, their relationship with, with the Department of Health and the state testing labs and, and what have you, the discrepancies, the jury is still out whether or not they have enough capacity or they have too much. You know, I, again, you know, it's, it's, it, it really is, um, they're standing up a brand new uh, bureaucracy here. And I don't use bureaucracy in a pejorative sense. I'm just saying, um, you know, bureaucracy that is gonna take some, you know, ma management. So I think that the, the Senate president was well within his rights. Like I said, he has all the credibility for him to call on something like this more than anybody else. And um, let's hope something good comes of it. But, you know, Ed, to your point, he's not playing gotcha. He just wants answers. He wants to put them on notice that we're paying attention. And I, and I applaud the Senate president for that. So, Michael, as we uh, come to a conclusion of this Lunch and Learn, again, cannot thank you enough uh, for your work as the strategic policy advisor to the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association. Your work is amazing. Uh, the detail that you are providing our membership is, is remarkable. And I echo your, your sentiment uh, going back to, to our, our early days in public policy uh, that, uh, look, everyone has the right to get involved. Everyone has the right to and do this. We encourage this, you to get do involved. it. Yep. And so, so we need to hear from you. The legislature needs to hear from you. The CRC needs to hear from you. So, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, before I turn it to you for some final remarks, I uh, just uh, once again want to thank our sponsors. Argus 365, the security firm, Birch and Trent Public Affairs, Cure Relief, current ATC and license holder and member of our board. I would like to thank Ease, I'd like to thank Frank Almeida and Financial Resources Federal Credit Union, who will be with us next week on Lunch and Learn. So thank you, Frank. I want to thank Garden State Greenhouse. I want to thank Puffin, Entrepreneurs and Investors, the Sheet Metal Workers, Local 19, Sprague Energy, new sponsor, Welcome Rich and your team, Siska Hennessy Group, a construction outfit, who will be doing a Lunch and Learn, uh, the UFCW, uh, locals 360 and 152, Hugh Giordano is hosting our April 27th NJCBA networking event. Check out our events uh, tab on our website. And lastly, Weeds Direct. Uh, again, want to thank Michael. Thank you so much uh, for, for all of your efforts. Again, there really would not be a New Jersey Cannabis Business Association if it were not for your early involvement. I uh, want to thank you all for joining us once again. I look forward to seeing you. When you get a chance, uh, whisper, sing a happy birthday to my daughter, Brianna, who turns a whopping 27 tomorrow, April, tw April 2nd. Wow. Uh, yeah, I know. Can you believe it? Uh, so once again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ABS, Association Business Solutions, for once again uh, producing this program. And uh, Tuesday... April 5th, Stockton University, uh, the Career Fair and Expo in Stockton, and do tune in to the April 11th CRC meeting. Thank you all so much for joining. Michael, any uh, last uh, comments? Um, so one of our panel or one of our guests here just asked a question. I said in the chat there, there's my email address, Jamie Fangberg, reach out to me. I encourage any of you, if you have a question about any of the legislation or just have a question, reach out to Ed, reach out to me. There's my email address. You know how to get a hold of us through the Canada Business Association website. Please, 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 please reach out to us and get information. We're happy to help. That's what we're here for. That's what your membership gives you. Okay. I'm more than happy to spend some time with you.